thank you so much, Kabir, for joining me today. I'm so excited that we get to share this beautiful book with our audience in the house of remembering the living tradition of Sufi teaching. Now, I'm just going to remind everyone that Kabir is founder, along with Camille, his wife, of the Threshold Society, and you can check out more about their work on sufism.org. But Dede, I wanted really to bring this work because so many people have asked me over the last few months in particular, what is the Sufi path? What does it entail? What does it mean? And this book has really been the gift for me in 2020. <laughs> Yeah. So I just wanted to sort of share more of it with you today, where hopefully people can start to get a taste of what these 31 short lessons, otherwise called sobets, spiritual conversations, actually mean. And I'd love you to just share in your words what you feel a sobet means. Mm. So that is a friendly conversation with a purpose. And the root meaning of the word is companionship. So, you know, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't have dervishes, didn't have followers or students. He had companions, right? That's the terminology we use. And so Sobet is one of the most important means of teaching or transmitting the wisdom of this tradition is when hearts come together and connect around a particular spiritual theme. And then we pray, we hope for some flow to take place and for hearts to receive what's needed at that moment. In the book, I also read that there's a mixture, and also I've experienced this in Solberts with you and, and, and dearest Anne, which is a mix of Sufi stories weaved together with Rumi poetry, the personal experiences, and of course the scriptural reminders, all of which come through. Um, and I'm just drawn, I'm going to share some comments actually from. Uh, Professor James W. Morris, I mean, he shares that the conversations bring balance um, and creative tension between community and communion, meditation, active service, awareness of the timeless, together with the immersion in shared challenges of everyday life. We have another comment from Jeremy Hensel Thomas, who's a visiting fellow at the Centre of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge. And he shares about this amazing book, that this is the work of an authentic teacher who helps us in sincerity and love to reflect deeply on our inner states within the concrete realities of our daily lives. And by so doing, to come even closer to our longed for awareness of divine reality. So, I mean, the book kicks off today with um, Dearest Muhammad Mustafa, and, and he labels this as a school of love. And I was so touched with just how he shares that the ego can be tamed by love, and the heart is our inner capacity to receive and comprehend meaning, and spirit being our inner point of direct contact with the divine. Can you just share up a little bit more? Because later, I mean, Memus goes on to describe how, even though he's been very well versed in the Quran, in Islam, it wasn't until he heard yourself with Salim Baba saying to him what he knew to be truth within his innermost being. And he felt this fire of longing igniting in his heart. It just felt irresistible. And I too vouch for meeting you and Annie in 2008 and experiencing that first soul bed. Um, and I'm, I just can't find words. It was just completely indescribable. So what would you say to someone who's completely new and who doesn't have any clue about Sufism? 
<laughs> hmm. You know, I experienced the same thing that you're describing for yourself when I came into the presence of our teachers, especially our first Murshid, Sulamandede. There is a transmission. The word for it is baraka. Nowadays, we talk about the phenomenon of resonance. Well, there's a resonance that goes all the way back through these great saints, all the way back to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other prophets. And so it's like a channel is opened and something begins to flow through the hearts of these people who have matured in the tradition, who have, as we say, have been cooked <laughs> in the tradition, have gone from being raw to being cooked. So I, who knows what it is or how it works, but the reality of this tradition, of this lineage, of this deen, this religion, I might say, the reality of this deen, um, what people must have experienced in the company of Prophet Muhammad, that hasn't died. That's not gone. It's alive in the inheritors of the prophetic tradition, who are those who participate in and through no particular uh, great attainment or virtue of their own, of our own, somehow are brought into that resonance and are able to convey it to others when there are receptive hearts that allow that flow to take place. So to some extent, you may find this in the words of this book, words which, by the way, were never meant to be published. They were spoken from heart to heart, uh, often in, uh, out of a need for those hearts. So what's those black marks on the white page <laughs> somehow may also carry a bit of this baraka a bit of this resonance because we live in a universe of meaning, not just a material, spatial, time-bound reality, but we live also simultaneously in this other spiritual reality where an energy, a vibration, a quality can, can come through, even through words on the page. So it seems you've described that yourself to me. I mean, I started reading this and, and tears just started pouring. I didn't stop to overanalyze why I was crying. I just felt cleansed mm -hmm. in the same way that Memu describes on reading the pages. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you thought about this aspect of time because the soul bets, there are 31 that you bring in this book. I believe it's your first collection with, there are hundreds of recordings worthy to be transcribed and hopefully inshallah, there might be other collections coming. Um, but the soul bets in this book, Dede, in the House of Memory, they don't seem to be in chronological order. And I'm just wondering, does the time, um, in our understanding, like does that actually matter? Um, and for you, did time matter on the quality or content of your soul bets? Um, and for a reader interested in the Sufi path, does it make a difference that they're not following the soul bets in a chronological manner? Mm -hmm. This book came together in a most accidental way. I don't know how the chapters were chosen it just arrived. Some friends tr did transcriptions 
and the first transcriptions that were done. And as far as I know, they didn't read through, uh, you know, a hundred sohbets and rank, and rank them. <laughs> they just started working on them and they arrived to me to be viewed and edited a little bit. And all I did was move one or two chapters a little bit, rearrange them in the book because I had an idea of where it should end. I think I moved two or three of these chapters. So no, it's not about some linear, linear systematic presentation. It's not a linear program. The reality that we're entering is nonlinear. It's comprehensive. It's holographic. It's just as with, with Mevlana Rumi, every poem, every page of his writing expresses essentially the same truth, which is the awesome beauty and generosity of the divine and our need for the divine. So the tradition of Sufism is so coherent that in a way we can enter it anywhere. And we can also even draw upon different great Sufi teachers, uh, you know, beyond our particular Mevlevi lineage. As we do, we bring in Ibn Abad of Randa, we bring in Ibn Arabi and others. And because of the deep coherence of the tradition, there is no contradiction. And it forms a wholeness and therefore uh, it's, you can read it in any order. Although I think the first chapter, which is something like, why do we need a spiritual teaching? That's pretty fundamental. I think that I put that one there at the beginning. It seemed to be a necessary introduction. You remember how it begins? Somebody actually asked me the question, you know, if I'm a good person, uh, do, do I need religion? If I'm a moral person, what do I need religion for? So I attempt to answer that question in the first chapter. And of course, it has to do with a number of issues, one of which is the beauty of human character is infinitely improvable. <laughs> Inshallah, infinitely improvable. Um, you know, it's coming through as well, just as you sort of touched upon this non-linearity and the, the intention. It's when you refer to it as like this cooking process. And I think this is really important in today's world of instant fix and instant gratification. It's actually quite a slow process. <laughs> Certainly that's been my experience, but I may just be a very slow learner. Um, but I, 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 yeah. I really am. Um, so am I. I'm amazed at the things I'm still learning at my age. And I often, you know, marvel. Why didn't I see that before? <laughs> it's extraordinary. And I, I think that's what... If I'm honest, I think it was initially a struggle because I kind of felt like, well, if I did, you know, you, we've been so raised to you do A, you do B, and you hit C. And C is your goal of enlightenment, or whatever you want to call it, or inner peace, where everything's fine, and ta-da, you can just go away and sail away into the sunset. Whereas this has just shown, this is this never, I think you've referred to it actually in the book as the never-ending process and... Of course, I, I still remember your soul bed at one of the retreats, the never ending search for Huck or truth. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. So the human being is infinitely developable, improvable, and also the a person may be 
living a moral life, serving others, even accomplishing heroic feats. But if such a person is living only in this material time-space existence, and they haven't, I mean, consciously become aware that our own inner strength, our own awareness and knowledge, energy, generosity, and all things beautiful in human nature are flowing to us from an infinite invisible source. If a person in some way does not sense that, uh, be aware of that in some fashion and not necessarily through a dogmatic religion or theology, but if a person doesn't have an awareness of that beyond with a capital B that is so necessary and that to cooperate with, then they're working with very limited resources and they're missing something vitally important. So this is one of the things that Islam at its best, properly understood, awakens us to. It's our need for the divine and for putting the divine at the center of our awareness uh, in order that we can receive the help and guidance and even love that the divine offers. So we need this relationship. And yes, somebody could have an, some innate intuitive sense of that and possibly not even know how to name it. But when you name it, understand it, and become more conscious of it, and begin to understand its principles and rely upon them in our lives, then we have access to a faith, a trust, an inner strength uh, that we would not otherwise have. And someone without that connection to the infinite divine reality um, may do a lot of good, but they may also run into a wall at a certain point or fall into a hole and not know how to deal with it not and then and be defeated by it but the dervish the lover of god can never be defeated there's nothing that can defeat the true lover of god the real dervish well i'm just going to pull up some screens because you know in it you've said that and i relate to this in in life in earth school that you know, we can think with our content. We talk about, you know, the inner voice making statements like I feel good about myself, I feel terrible about myself. Everything's about the content. And actually your primary objective or the primary objective of a Sufi circle is to guide us and to help us open up into that inner life. And then here you share, you know, what do we mean by coherence, which referred to earlier we don't know which way to turn we don't know what to do how to choose this or that and even when we do we're still beset with second thoughts and distractions and then you talk about this really beautiful story of hair being clad in a patchwork robe fragmented but from his master he learns to weave which is the art of integration and i'd love to just bring this story to us now mm. Yes. Well, the idea here is that we can be fragmented and internally in conflict, uh, riddled with conflicting desires, distractions, uh, self-doubt, and so forth. But spirituality as we understand it, 
is the awakening and purification of the heart, the strengthening of the heart so that the heart becomes a magnetic center of the human being. Sufism creates strong-hearted people, good-hearted people. And the heart is both a physical reality and also a metaphor for our spiritual center and all of the subtle faculties uh, that the human being has. But it is something magnetic and powerful when the heart connects to God, when the heart, yes, loves and relies upon that divine source, then the energy of spirit begins to flow into the individual human heart. And that becomes the magnetic center around which this coherence of the, of the character and even of the outer personality begins to take shape. So this is spiritual psychology. This is a reality. And when we say coherence, we're using a word that perhaps one might, you know, a religious person might ask, well, where is coherence mentioned in the Quran or in Islam? Well, that brings us to the word Tawheed. Actually, I don't think Tawheed, the word is in the Quran, but the concept certainly is. Tawhid, which has been translated as monotheism, a very insufficient translation, would better be translated as coherence. Tawhid is, it's related to the root for oneness. And to live in a Tawhidic reality and to realize Tawhid in oneself is to be become coherent through that connection with the very oneness of spirit, with the mystifying, uh, difficult to explain oneness, which is in every part of the universe. And this is uh, so much of Rumi's teaching is about this. In fact, he calls his great six volume masterwork, the Mathnawi or Mesnavi, he calls it the workshop of oneness. Every story, every poem, every sub sublime invocation, every vulgar joke in it is about realizing how oneness permeates everything. And by oneness, we don't mean uh, oneness in the sort of a common interfaith interpretation, which is fine, namely, the divine being can operate through all sincere religions, but we mean something, uh, something even deeper is meant. And that is that in every circumstance of life, in every event of life, in every particle of being is a relationship to this divine oneness and every part, every circumstance is serving to reveal the very nature of reality. And the very nature of reality is fundamentally beneficent, loving, generous. It's the opposite. A person who enters into this faith, this Iman, uh, instead of having paranoia, which is unreasonable fears, has pronoia, which is the, the conviction, the sense that the divine is always working for our benefit, the benefit of our true selves, the benefit of our souls, if we will just cooperate with it and be aware of it. So much is coming to heart, actually, because I remember once asking you and, and discussing vulnerability, and you asked me what's the opposite which is invulnerability. And I guess it's kind of moving towards what you've described, which can feel quite limited in the rational mind. And because there's almost like a, 
new relationship that's required to the understanding of concepts such as pain, joy, and kind of surrendering all the sort of physical, emotional experiences to that one unified reality. I'm just going to pull up one, one more slide because it beautifully segues into some lines of Rumi that are, are well known, but actually I, I never saw them in this way before, which is out beyond ideas of faith or denial, Iman, there is a field. Uh, Iman or Kufra, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, even the words you and I have no meaning. What I want to ask of you is, let's say you have someone who considers themselves to be a devout Muslim and they're hitting their prayer mat every single day. What for them would she, what would they experience that different to what they're not being fed with already in following a prescription of five days of prayer, reading the Quran and learning and following some of the Hadith? Well, everything depends on motivation. If we're praying to avoid the punishment of hell or to earn the rewards of heaven, we're playing a kind of game with God and we're still rooted in the, the self, the false self um, that calculates its own benefit and that is still governed by fear and desire. It's possible for us, in fact, it's essential for the human being to give all that up. <laughs> it sounds very far-fetched, um, but it's not when you experience the, a bit of that divine love and you experience that you are loved by the divine. I mean, I guess it's what Abraham did actually <laughs> with his forefathers. Explain. Well, he denounced all the conditionings and yeah. ways of his parents and the community and culture around him at the time to stand truth in this intimate relationship with his Lord. Yes, yes. Well, this is the key. Let's just follow this. To find that intimate relationship, which is our birthright, which our nature longs for, and which is the only thing that is truly satisfying, that can be found by the, by the Muslim on his prayer carpet, especially in the moment of prostration. Yes, it's possible to know that. And if we can just follow that, deepen in that, deepen in what's in that pr prostration, Quran says, bow down and draw near. All these things, they're there in the revelation, they're there in the Quran, even if they're overlooked and sometimes misunderstood. Yeah, it's all very clear in the revelation, but it's the mystics like Nathlana Jalaluddin Rumi and Shemzi Tabrizi and other greats, and some too many greats to name, who really embody the reality of this, who have lived this, who are shining examples of it. And through their baraka, through their resonance, we will energetically uh, experience, experience that love, that humility, that true submission, which is submission to love, not submission out of fear, 
It's not a coerced submission. There is no coercion in this religion, as the Quran says. It really is about submitting, surrendering in love. Love not as a concept, not as an idea, but as an experience. But we have that, we may not have that experience until we're around people who are in that state. And they could be, they don't have to be some, uh, shall we say, famous sheikh or murshid. Uh, it could even more likely come through a humble dervish, some unknown lover of God operating some, you know, small shop somewhere selling, you know, modest goods. Um, I remember being brought to, a, introduced to a great wali in a city in Morocco. And I was told that this man is one of the, the highest, most spiritually attained people in a particular tradition. And I was brought by the, his shop and his shop was so small. It was a little bit bigger than my desk it was literally, I mean, literally, it was a hole in the wall. And he was sitting there cross-legged in his little hole in the wall. And I think he was sold some kind of herbs. And he was just this ancient man with the most radiant smile. And he was a great merchant of a particular lineage. Uh, but you would have passed by him. You would not have... Uh, thought of him as some great, great figure. So these people, the point is that there are beings like this in the world and there are communities like this as well. It's in a way easier to find it in a community of sincere people. Um, and ideally with a sheikh, a murshid, who is a humble person who doesn't rely on special privileges for himself or herself, but is, is a servant of the community. Well, I just wanted to touch on this now because, I mean, we've talked about Sufism in relationship to, say, classical Islam or traditional Islam. But I want to kind of also do a comparison with modern mindfulness and this sort of world of pop psychology um, and academia. And what you share here is this process of mindfulness is more than a way to achieve stress reduction and relaxation as it has been and is being used in the corporate world, pop psychology and academia. Mindfulness being just the first step. And then actually you talk about community too, that really being the catalyst part of this mechanism for transformation. And I love what you share here about Western society being so individualistic, which perhaps this year, the spotlight on that has been shone. Um, I'll just finish sort of reading from the book that you say that we find ways of avoiding relationship and seek transformation that will occur at our own convenience or according to our own preferences. Some people reach the stage where they say, Oh, I might be better off alone now. I think I'm getting enough of this spiritual stuff and I'll just do it by myself. They give up the friction of relationship and the challenge of it, retreating into their own world. So just tell us a bit more. I mean, I've experienced it firsthand, this inter the importance of the interrelationship in the heart's polishing. Yeah, well, this again is an answer to the question of why do we need a spiritual path and why is not ordinary life necessarily enough to uh, accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So a spiritual path in Sufism is a very relational uh, network, not an individual tutorial, not something to, to get from books alone or primarily. It's a commitment to work together with others, be in relationship with others, 
serve with others and to overcome the obstacles that we put in the way of love. And with that commitment that also requires patience and perseverance, with that kind of commitment, we set out on a journey that has no end. And we are always and continually learning. The dervishes, the students, the seekers are learning. <clears throat> the teacher, the sheikh, the murshid is also learning. And we are sometimes learning from our, the sheikh is sometimes learning from the student. When the sheikh sees modesty, humility, devotion in the student, there's a teaching in that for the teacher. Um, so there is a reason why we live in a world of relationships. There's a reason why spiritual reality requires this. And it's because the individual human being is not the ultimate unit of reality or the most important human unit of reality, as important as individuality is. And we respect it and we also cultivate it. But even our individuality is not fulfilled alone or by being alone. It's always fulfilled in relationship. And in a, ideally, in a Sufi community, we find people who are committed to, to overcoming the false self and the false values and the false reality and committed to focusing on what is most real and committed to the idea <clears throat> that this life is a school of love and that all the most important lessons are lessons of love and that the very nature of the ultimate reality is love. You, in the book, talk about the seven levels of reality, Dede, and I think this for me was the key differentiation of, you know, the, the two very distinct aspects of Sufi practice, one being meditation and the other remembrance. So I'm just going to read again from the book. You say that we make a distinction between these two very similar yet distinct processes. Meditation is an act of self-awareness. It's listening within, coming into your own deepest center in order to move from the false self to what we call the essential or higher self, the source of consciousness. Meditation is about the mastery of attention and observation. Whereas remembrance goes a step beyond. Remembrance fosters an awareness the capacity that develops. And I've got another quote, page 72, you say, we become and are imbued with the fragrance of whatever we hold in the space of our hearts. We can hold continual gratitude, trust and humility with the awareness of our dependence on the one. We can be in continual non-blame. For the Sufi, the intention is to be in continual glorification that glorification arises from remembering and recognizing the beauty, power, and glory of the divine. I'm just going to show one more screen talking from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the angel, or the archangel Gabriel talking to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Sai ibn Abdullah sharing. Um, everywhere littered with this concept of remember me, I remember you. The prophet, peace be upon him, saying the rank God most high grants to his servant corresponds to the rank his servant accords to him. And I love the reminder that it's simple. It may not be easy. Um, so I just want to hear more about this. Um, why is it not easier? It is so simple when we hear it. But you can go through days, you know, minutes, 
hours, days, without remembering. Yes. Well, f first of all, there is a teaching that is expressed in words with intellectual concepts. Uh, when the teaching is clarified, it helps us to remember. When we're part of a living community, uh, even if we're not necessarily living in close proximity to each other, which is not possible for everybody, but still we're connected to a network of people, we get reminders and we are less drawn into the superficial values of, the, of society and, the, and worldliness. But going back to the distinction between meditation and remembrance or between mindfulness slash presence and remembrance. Mindfulness or presence is a state of self-awareness that needs to be cultivated in order to awaken from utter heedlessness. Okay, so it's a first step. Mindfulness can be actually a kind of a shallow mental state. Presence, as we understand it and describe it, is can be a bit more comprehensive because our thoughts, feelings, and, and bodily existence are all held in a single field of awareness, but it's still self-awareness. As we learn to sustain that state of presence, we may come to the realization that presence itself is not our own self-creation, not sourced in us, but flowing to us and through us from an infinite source. When we acknowledge that, when we feel and sense that, then we're getting moving out of the, the domain of mere self-awareness into the, the domain where we come into relationship with the infinite divine. And we may reach such a state that the word glorification makes sense to us. We might say glory be to God. We're just in awe of what's really going on in every moment of our lives, even though most of the time we don't see it. So this movement from the uh, technique of mindfulness, or even the technique of presence, to that state of awe that also awakens humility and love and these other dimensions of devotion and relationship that moves us into the, into the domain of remembrance of God. So this is the direction we want to move in and this is what's possible for us. It's what we're designed for. It is the purpose of life to experience that because the experience of it is infinitely varied, infinitely beautiful, uh, never ending, and the one thing that truly brings peace and tranquility to the heart, to the restless heart. Yes, well, thank you so much. I mean, it's such a rich text. We're gonna to have to bring you back to talk about the second half of the book. So thank you so much, Kabir, and I look forward to learning more as we go.